I'm Betsy Green, Executive Director of the Georgia Youth Science and Technology Centers. I am so happy to introduce you to our organization and the wonderful work we do. For 31 years, GYCC has been the leading nonprofit advocate in Georgia for excellence in science, technology, engineering, and math education at the elementary level. We advocate for our hardworking Georgia teachers with ongoing professional development training so they can maintain the highest skill levels to prepare our children for success. We advocate continuously for quality science education for Georgia children and their families with year-round activities for kindergarten through eighth grade students. Our reach is statewide with special focus on those children and communities who are underserved and need us most. We are enthusiastic and we are creative. GYCC programs are available so entire communities can come together around science-based exploration, education, and fun. Today, I'd like to share one such program we are most proud of, Georgia Discover Camp. As you will see, it's a learning camp with a science twist. Any Georgia student can participate and every Georgia student will enjoy what we have in store. Please take a look. Hey, my name is Erin Yeomans and I work for Magnolia Midlands GYSTC located at East Georgia State College in Swainsboro, Georgia. Today we are going to explore the Ohupi River and the sandhill habitat that surrounds it. We're going to look at different plants and animals that thrive in this region. So I'm standing on the bank of the Ohupi River in Emanuel County. The Ohupi River starts in Tennell, Georgia, and flows through several counties before reaching Emanuel County, and then in Tattnall County, joins the Altamaha River to flow out into the Atlantic Ocean. The Creek Indians lived and thrived in this area. They were named the Creek Indians because they were found along the creeks of Georgia. These artifacts were actually found on this farm. They are dated back to about 1,200 years ago. You may notice that there is a lot of sand around here. This area is home to unique plants and animals that can only live here and thrive here and they don't live or thrive anywhere else in our great state of Georgia. It's very beautiful here but it is really a harsh environment. The only things that live and thrive here are things that have adapted over the years. So you'll notice that Everything is kind of thick and overgrown, but when a fire comes along, it will allow all of that to be burned out and new growth can occur. And by doing that, plants that are on the ground of the, the floor here in the sand hill habitat can regenerate, grow, and the animals around here can find food again. And the, the plants that, that were kind of crowded out by the um, overgrowth of the trees and the bushes can now thrive in the sunlight. There are lots of beautiful plants and animals here, but there are also beautiful plants and animals around your home, maybe in your backyard. I'd like to share an app with you that you can put on your phone or iPad. You can go in your backyard and check out what kind of plants you have. It's called Picture This. All you have to do is open the app and then it's going to have a spot for you to take a picture of the leaves of the plant and then once you take the picture it will begin identifying it and it tells me that this is a saw palmetto and I know that saw palmettos grow in sandy regions which is why it grows and thrives here in the sand hill. There are also apps that you can get to help you identify birds. This one that I have on my phone is called a smart bird ID and all you have to do is record some of the sounds that the bird makes and it will help you identify the birds that you have in your backyard as well. And then you can do some research to find out more information about those birds and those plants that you have in your backyard. So those will definitely be different than the ones that you are seeing here. And throughout the state of Georgia, depending on which region that you live in, you will notice that we have different things that are suited for the different environments in each region. So we have here a gopher tortoise hole. Gopher tortoises 
live to be anywhere from 50 years old. They've even found some that are in their 90s. So I'm very excited to show you this hole today. Gopher tortoises dig burrows. They have special shovel-like claws that help them to dig. Just last week, my husband and I were riding and we came by one of these and we saw dirt flying in the air. And it was a mother gopher tortoise digging out her burrow. Now what's really neat about the gopher tortoise is that they are called a keystone species. Keystone species are ones that because of them, many other organisms are able to survive. And if something happened to the gopher tortoise because they are a keystone species, scientists believe that the other species that live and thrive because of them, their numbers would decrease. So things that live in the gopher tortoise hole usually are things like frogs, mice, and other animals, even things like owls will go in there to find protection. Things like bobwhite quail, rabbits, rattlesnakes, eastern indigo snakes, they'll all find protection in the gopher tortoise hole. So these are really exciting to find. This gopher tortoise hole has probably been here for a good while. You can notice how big it is and how much sand she has removed. They could be up to 12 feet deep and about 40 foot long. Scientists believe that up to 350 different species take shelter in the gopher tortoise home. The burrows provide protection from them during the fires that we talked about that are beneficial to the Sand Hill region. So these species can quickly run into a gopher tortoise burrow to seek protection from the fire. So this is one of the mutualistic relationships that we were just talking about. This is a prickly pear cactus and you'll notice how the gopher tortoise built her burrow right near the cactus. So when she's looking for food, she'll come out, she'll nibble on the cactus, which in turn prunes the cactus. And then it also provides nutrition for the tortoise. So it is a mutualistic relationship. They both benefit from it. So what's really cool about these gopher tortoise burrows is that they stay a relative temperature and humidity throughout the year. So they provide good insulation in the summer and winter months. And that's why all these other species like to find protection from the weather and the, the forest fires and all from all the things that nature throws at them by going into the gopher tortoise hole. So on our walk over here, we found these deer antlers. That's just another proof of some of the types of animals that you'll find here. Deer, turkeys, all in this area here. So now that I've taken you around the riverine sand hill of Georgia along the Ohupi River, I hope that you've gotten excited about all these plants and animals that lived here. Maybe you would like to have a job where you could study about these plants and animals. Uh, my brother-in-law is a wildlife biologist and on a daily basis he gets to go out and ban ducks. They get to go out and keep data on endangered and threatened species such as the gopher tortoise. He gets to go out and try to figure out ways to protect all the threatened species around the state. If you enjoy learning about plants and animals, that might be the career for you. Thanks for joining me today as we've traveled through the Ohupi River area here. If you'd like more information about these plants or animals or even the STEM careers that are possible that you can use to learn more about these animals, just check us out on our website. Go to our gystc.org webpage and you'll find more information and lots of cool activities that you can do to go along with this. Good morning, my name is Erin Yeomans and I work for Magnolia Midlands Georgia Youth Science and Technology Center located at East Georgia State College in Swainsboro, Georgia. Um, today we are here for the second day of the Discover Georgia STEM camp for grades three through five. I'm so excited that you're able to join me today. We're going to be discovering three things during this session. The first thing we're gonna talk about animal adaptations. Yesterday with Miss Pam, you talked about plant adaptations, but today we're going to focus on animal adaptations. The certain um, features that allow plants and animals to live and thrive in the regions that they live in.
The second thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the engineering design process and use it to solve problems. Um, we're going to look at a challenge and we're going to be trying to figure out a way to solve that challenge using the engineering design process. And then third, we're going to take a virtual field trip to one of my favorite rivers in Georgia. And along the way, you're going to get to visit a sand hill habitat. So to start off with, you may want to go ahead and get some materials. This is not a step-by-step -step activity. This is kind of an open-ended challenge that you're going to do. But I have some suggested materials for you. Um, you can grab some popsicle sticks. I have some pipe cleaners, some straws, some duct tape, some cups, some plastic wrap, um, a pair of scissors, and you definitely will need some paper and a pencil to draw your plan. But you don't have to have all these materials, just some. I mean, like I said, it's open-ended, and so um, you may use these or you may find others around your house that you would like to use. So now I'm going to read a story. It's called How and Why Do Animals Adapt? And it's written by Bobby Cowman. Why do animals adapt? Sometimes when there are big changes in an animal's life, the animal has to change to stay alive. Changing to suit a new habitat is called adaptation. Animals adapt to find food, survive hot or cold temperatures, and escape danger. The animals that adapt easily are the ones that have the best chance of staying alive. Many animal adaptations happen over hundreds or even millions of years. Some happen more quickly. Adaptations can happen in the body or in the way that an animal behaves. Changing the ways they move has helped some animals get from one place to another faster. Birds and bats have made one of the biggest adaptations when their bodies changed so that they could fly. Other animals have also adapted their ways of moving to suit new habitats or to keep themselves safe. This is a dolphin here. Its flippers are made up of fingers under its skin. It uses its flippers to swim. Most kangaroos hop along the ground, but one kind of kangaroo climbs trees and lives up in the branches. Tree kangaroos have adapted to living in trees because forests grew in their habitats and they could find more food up in the trees. Deserts are dry places with very little rain. Few plants grow in deserts because they are so dry, so animals that live there must adapt in order to find enough food and water to stay alive. Camels, for example, store fat and humps on their backs. The fat provides them with energy when they cannot find food or water. Some animals live in burrows or holes to stay out of the sun. So this is a fennec fox, and the fennec fox has adapted to its hot, dry desert home. Its long ears allow heat to escape from its body and to hear prey moving underground. The fox gets water from the food that it eats. To hide from the hot sun, the fox spends most of its day in an underground burrow it has dug in the sand. The colors of the fennec fox and camel blend in with their sandy habitat. How does blending in help keep these animals safe? Think about that. Some animals live in cold places for all or part of the year. Body adaptations and changes in behavior keep them warm in freezing cold temperatures. This is a snow leopard. The snow leopard has adapted to winter in its rocky mountain home. The leopard's thick fur keeps it warm. Its long tail helps it balance. Its big chest helps it breathe the thin mountain air. The leopard's big paws help it walk and climb in the snow. And then this is a picture of a bear. A bear sleeps during much of the winter. It wakes up on warmer days to stretch or snack on stored food. So think about how do you keep warm in the winter? How are your adaptations the same or different from these animals? Many animals migrate or move to other habitats to escape cold weather, find food and water, or have babies. Many kinds of birds, such as Canada geese and Arctic terns, migrate to warmer places for the winter.
One of the most important adaptations animals have made is living in groups. Animals that belong to families or communities can help one another find food and keep safe. Examples of animal groups are monkey troops, lion prides, dolphin pods, and meerkat mobs. This is a picture of some meerkats. Meerkats live in mobs of 20 to 30 members. They live in large underground homes. Groups of meerkats guard their homes and watch for predators while others look for food. Working together helps keep these animals safe. Some animals have developed coloring or patterns on their bodies that help them blend in with their habitats. This is called camouflage. Camouflage helps hide them from predators or prey. Many animals also use mimicry. Mimicry makes animals look like plants or other animals, making it hard to tell what or where they are. This here is a leaf insect that looks and moves like the leaves on which they live. They're hidden by camouflage. They even rock back and forth to mimic leaves being blown by the wind. Isn't that cool? The bodies of some animals have changed so much that it's hard to believe they are part of the animal groups to which they belong. Mud skippers, tree shrews, and eye eyes are just a few examples. Now this one here has really caught my interest. This is a mud skipper. Mud skippers are fish that can live on land as well as in the water. They can walk, skip, leap, dig, and swim. They can even climb trees. Can you believe that? These fish can breathe through their mouths and skin. Y'all need to look those up after this session because they are very interesting. Many animals must live in cities when cities take up land that was once their habitat. Some animals adapt easily to city life and live longer because they can find more food there. City animals include squirrels, foxes, coyotes, raccoons, and skunks. Omnivores are animals that eat both plants and other animals. They have a much better chance of surviving in cities than herbivores or carnivores. Most omnivores eat almost anything they can find. This raccoon is eating a pet cat food. Have you ever seen a, a raccoon that might have come up to eat some of your pet's food before? So, how do we adapt? Compare and contrast your adaptations to those of the animals in this book. Write stories about how you have adapted to changes in your life. And here are some examples of how you might have adapted. Have you ever moved to a new home? Think about the changes that we go through from summer to winter. <clears throat> Think about a time when you might have had to find a new friend or learn to speak a new language or even just changing your thinking about something. So we adapt as well. Okay, so we learned that adaptation is really all about survival and that is the way that an animal will survive and thrive in its environment. I want to share a few pictures with you of some of my favorite adaptations that I have found. Okay, so the first one is a lizard. So if you'll check that one out, the lizard here has a tail that will snap off when a predator tries to capture it. And you may have noticed in the book, you might have heard the words predator and prey. Predators are animals that hunt for food. Prey are the animals that are being hunted. So the lizard's tail will snap off when something tries to eat it. Okay. The next picture here is an armadillo. An armadillo has a hard covering that makes it hard for predators to eat. And now I'd like to share some pictures of camouflage with you. Look carefully at this picture. Do you see anything hidden in the picture? Okay. There is the gray tree frog. It was hidden there using camouflage. So a predator probably wouldn't be able to see that. Okay, take a look at this one. Now this probably looks like a lot of your backyards. This looks like my backyard and I tell my boys all the time to be careful when they're walking through leaves like this, especially now. Look carefully and see if you can find anything hidden. There's a snake there. Did y'all find that? 
Okay, and now we're going to look at one more. See if you can find something hidden in this picture. Look carefully. That one's really hard to spot. Do you see it over to the right? That's an impala. Check out the camouflage there. It blends in almost perfectly with its surroundings. This is another picture that's one of my favorites. It talked about this in our book. This is a bear hibernating. This is a way that animals survive the long winters. They go into a deep sleep, their heartbeat and their breathing slows, and they don't eat or drink. All right, now we're going to talk about mimicry. You heard that word in the book as well. Mimicry is when animals copy sounds, behavior, color patterns of other animals for protection. This hoverfly mimics the color of wasps, so predators think they sting. Even humans think they sting. Look at the colors of that. They're bright and they're kind of scary looking because you automatically think of the wasp when you see that. But those hoverflies are actually pretty harmless. So these are all adaptations that animals use to survive. Humans can learn from nature and design solutions by mimicking or copying how animals use their physical characteristics to help them survive. Biomimicry is a way that we can solve human problems using nature. So look at the porcupine. Researchers have been looking at porcupines and studying the quills. The porcupine quills have backward facing barbs so that they go into um, whatever is near them, they go into them pretty easily. So researchers have been studying the porcupine barbs to, to look for ways to find better needles. They've also looked at them because of the barbs that they have to see about making patches that might help stay on human skin longer so that we could deliver medicine more effectively. So these are just some ways that researchers are studying animals and looking at the adaptations that they have to make our life better. And that's called biomimicry. So I want us to look at our challenge today that we're going to be attempting to work on. You may not finish this during this session, but that's okay. This is a, a challenge that we can use to make our lives better, and that's what engineers do. I want us to think of a way to design a new medical device or a piece of equipment that will improve health care in the future using ideas that come from plant or animal adaptations in nature. So how many of you have used the engineering design process before? One of my friends is an engineer and she tells me all the time that they really do use this. So if you're thinking about, you know, engineers build roads and bridges and tall buildings, they don't just wake up one morning and decide, hey, I want to build a tall building. They go through a process. So I'm going to write these steps down and we're going to talk about what the process is. Some of you might have done this in your school before and some of you may not have. The first one is ask. Okay, and that is where we think about what the challenge is. What is it that we know? What is it that we're trying to solve? Today we're trying to solve something to do in the medical field. We're wanting to design a device that will make our life better. Okay? The next step is imagine. Now, I always tell kids when we do this, everybody has great ideas. You just have ideas that are floating around in your head, but it's always good to get those ideas out on paper. So you want to start jotting down your ideas during the imagine phase. This is just brainstorming. Okay, and then you also would like to probably do some research during this time. Um, research is very important to find out what's already been done ahead of you, what information is already out there. Okay, so ask, imagine, and then we create a plan. This is where engineers would probably draw a blueprint, something on paper that they can follow. Okay. After that, number four, from our plan, we would go right into creating. Now, engineers have to consider a lot of things like budgets and time constraints, but today 
We have our materials laid out here and you can really use whatever you have at home for this one. But this is where you get your materials and you actually build it. Step number five is improve. During the improve phase, you look at what you've created and you say, okay, how could I make this better? Is there anything that I could do to it that might fix whatever problem that you think that it has? And then at any time during the engineering design process, you can always go back. You may have to go back to your brainstorming and, and go back and sit down. You may have to do more research. But this is what engineers really use. This is the process. I have found that this process really helps us solve any challenge that you might face in your daily life. So <clears throat> if I'm considering the challenge that I have at hand today, that I want to create a new medical device that will improve our quality of life, but something that comes from nature. So I sat down and I started thinking, okay, what are some of the challenges that we currently have in healthcare? Number one, when I go to the doctor, I don't like to have my blood pressure taken. The thing starts tightening up on my arm. So I started thinking about that. Sometimes I also don't like to get shots. And so I started thinking about that aspect as well. And I realized that researchers are already studying about the quills. <clears throat> and so I started thinking, what's another challenge that's out there? And so if we consider what's going on in our current world with the pandemic, um, my cousin had a really bad farming accident a couple of weeks ago. And after he was taken to the hospital, his wife and child could not go back there to visit him. So I started thinking, that's a problem that we need to solve. If this pandemic continues on, people are going to want to visit their family members in hospitals. So what is it that we can do? So <clears throat> I referred back to the engineering design process. And so I'd like for you to do that with me. I'm going to model how I solved this problem for myself. But I would, would like for you to come up with something. Just think right now, what, what kind of problem or challenge do you think of when you go to a doctor's office or to a hospital? Or think maybe you could talk with um, a caregiver, a family member that's at home. They may have some ideas of how they would like to improve um, what's going on when you go to, a, to visit a hospital or a doctor. So I'm going to get my that paper out and I'm going to start now thinking about brainstorming some ideas which I know I want to come up with something that would allow people to go in and out of hospitals um, to visit people that are sick without transmitting the virus. So I'm going to jot down some of my ideas. I would like for you to do this at home. So I'm writing down, I'm looking for features that would protect me, keep germs away, and I did some research ahead of time. I'd like to share a picture with you of a spider. This is a diving bell spider, okay? Look closely at this. This is a very unique spider that has a very interesting adaptation. The bell spider spins a silk web that looks like a diving bell. It captures bubbles of air in the hairs on its body when it goes to the water's surface. And then as it travels back down to its web, it takes those bubbles with them, and then that inflates the underwater house with air. So the bell spider is able to stay underwater for a whole day before returning to the surface to get more air. So I thought that is a really cool adaptation that they have. Could I take something from nature? Could I learn from what the bell spider does? And so I am going to now draw my plan. Thinking about the bell spider and thinking about that cool adaptation or feature that, that it has, I'm going to draw a plan. So I'm going to draw my person. I would like for you to work on your plan at home if you have an idea. 
Now, if you don't have an idea, it's okay. You may have to do more research. Like I said, this one is not just um, a step-by-step -step direction. This one is where you're going to solve this problem on your own. So if you're not with me right now, that is totally okay. You may still be brainstorming and getting some other ideas. And I'm going to draw my person. We're going to say this is me wanting to visit my cousin at the hospital, but I, I need some kind of protection on. So I'm going to take my inspiration from the bell spider. Okay. So I have a plan or a blueprint. And now I'm going to move on to step number four, which we said was create. So I'm going to go to my materials and I'm going to look and see, okay, what is it over here that I could use to make a model, a prototype? And so a prototype is just basically an early model of something. You may come back to that prototype and you may improve it you would make different versions of it. And this really happens with engineers. They make a, a model and then they go back and they're constantly improving it. So this is just gonna be a basic prototype. This is one that I'm just gonna start off with. It's an early model for this contraption that I'm coming up with that's gonna fit around a person's face that will keep them protected. So you see a lot of people now wearing masks. This is actually going to be something that goes around their whole head. And I took my idea from, remember, the bell spider. Okay? So I'm going to take my pipe cleaners. You take whatever you have at home and you make whatever it is, your device or piece of equipment that you are making at home. So I'm just going to make a model of a person out of pipe cleaners. Okay, I have a head, and I'm going to give it some arms. I hope you're making something really cool at home right now as well. I've got one arm. I usually use a lot of duct tape, but for this one, I can just bend these pipe cleaners. But duct tape is usually my best friend. When I go to schools and work with kids, they love to use duct tape. Okay, so there's my person, my arms. Let's see, I might have to cut some legs. Remember, yours can yours is probably totally different from mine. That's what I like about engineering design challenges. When I do these, no two um, groups are ever the same, and so. My idea is going to be totally different from your idea. And you may come up with something that would one day save somebody's life. And that would be really cool. You could tell them you learned it right here with us at camp. Okay. So I have my person. Looks pretty good. And so I think I'm going to take some plastic wrap. And I'm going to make this feature that's going to go around my person. And so I know this really wouldn't protect from germs, but remember this is just a model of what it is that we're going to make in real life one day when I become a bioengineer. Okay, so I'm going to cover my person up. So I'm in the create phase, and I'm making this. we got to have a way for, for this person to breathe. So I'm going to give it some air, I think. There we go. And so I'm mimicking or copying the bell spider and how the bell spider, remember, goes to the top to get the oxygen and then takes it back down to its underwater spider web. And so I just thought that was so cool that I wanted to use it in my example. Okay? So there is my example. Um, the next step, of course, is to improve. And there are... I'm sure plenty of ways that I could improve this. You will think about them from time to time. You know what? You might go to sleep tonight and wake up in the morning and say, oh, I know some way that I can make this even better. And that's what good engineers do. 
they look for ways to constantly improve whatever it is they're working on. So if it's a bridge or a tall building, they are looking for ways to always make it better, especially in the healthcare industry. You wanna look for ways to keep people safe and ways to make it better. Think about the engineers that just recently worked on the SpaceX program. They had, there were human lives involved in that. And so they wanted to be very sure that what they were doing was as good as they could get. They kept making improvements on it. And so that's what I would do with this. I would keep making improvements on it. I might decide to make a full body suit out of this, or I might decide to make, um, add some different features to it so that it would go around my face better or maybe add something that would keep it down or whatever. But this is my, um, this is just my way, my model for demonstrating how I would solve this problem. And so I would love to see your ideas on Facebook. So if you're working on something at home, have someone take a picture of it, share that with us on Facebook, okay? So I wanna to talk to you just a few minutes too about STEM careers. So at the beginning of this session, we were talking about animals and the adaptations that they have. And one STEM career that you may be interested in may be biology. If you've ever considered studying plants and animals, um, looking for ways to save plants and animals, or if you like watching shows on TV about plants and animals, you may wanna be a biologist one day. Another cool STEM career is a bioengineer. Bioengineers are designing equipment, just like we were doing today, that would make our lives better. And so if this really interests you, you may want to do that in the future. Um, I'm gonna share just a, a little bit before we go on our virtual field trip. Um, the virtual field trip is one of my favorite rivers in Georgia. Um, it is called the Ohoopy River. And I grew up right along the Ohoopy River in Washington County. And I am fortunate enough to still live within miles of this river. And so right up the road from my house, I just recently found out that gopher tortoises live there. And so I really got the idea for this lesson by looking at and studying gopher tortoises. Gopher tortoises help other critters. Without even really knowing it, they, they play such a large part in helping other animals. And so as we travel out to the Ohoopy River, I would like for you to look and see if you can um, spot the gopher tortoise holes, look for information about them, listen out for the words about being a keystone species. And so at home I have three boys and we love books at my house. This is another book, you might wanna add this to your summer reading list. It's called At Home with the Gopher Tortoise, the story of a keystone species. And this is one of my favorite books. I love reading about the gopher tortoise. I just wanna share this last page with you. I'm not gonna read the whole book. But we're talking about here how we can take lessons from nature. And so I'm gonna read this last page about the gopher tortoise. This humble animal, the gopher tortoise, is at the center of the web of life for so many creatures. Although it may not know it, the tortoise builds homes for spiders, crickets, beetles, flies, frogs, snakes, mice, rabbits, birds, skunks, bobcats, and many others. Can you believe that? A gopher tortoise helps that many other animals without even realizing it. And in the video, you'll find out how that happens. A whole community of creatures depend upon the gopher tortoise, a keystone species for survival. So how can we take a lesson from nature? How can we design something that will improve our lives? So I'd like for you to continue working on this project here. Um, like I said, I went through and modeled it for you, but you have your own ideas. You have, I'm sure, something creative going on right now. And I would love to see that. Just remember, as you go through the engineering design process, we have ask, that's where you 
Find out what it is you're trying to solve. Imagine. That's where you would brainstorm. You would look for um, maybe some ideas, some research. You would definitely do some research. When I did mine and I created my little um, medical device here, I had to go out online and look for, um, I, I just typed in cool adaptations for protecting an animal and lots of them came up and so the bell spider was one of those and that's where I took my, um, my idea from. So I definitely would do lots of research during the imagine portion. And then you would also just jot down your ideas like I did. You know, what is it that you're trying to do? Share your ideas with others. Now usually if you're at a school and I'm doing this with a group of kids, I usually say everybody has great ideas and you just have to share those and get them out so that we can talk about it because if you share your ideas with somebody else, they may have a good idea and you may have a good idea and it may be that you could combine all of the ideas. And then you want to make a plan. You want to draw it out like I did. So I made my plan. It's not a very pretty person, but that's my stick person. I made a plan. Then I created. And then you would always go back and improve and look, at, look for ways to make it better. So I hope that you've enjoyed this. Please share these with me on Facebook. I would love to see the cool ideas that you have. And now I want to um, take you on this virtual field trip to the Ohupi. It is um, a beautiful place. It's in the coastal region of Georgia, not far from my home. That's where I went, right up the road. Um, one of our family friends let me visit his farm that they have. It's just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. It's so peaceful. We heard lots of birds and we saw lots of evidence of animals. And so as you, you visit the Ohupi, I want you to think about animals that you see there, research those adaptations, and I hope that you've had a great day today, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you so much.